This material can give you a clear picture of the core principle that lies behind the Slavic imperfective and perfective verb aspects. For that we shall look at an event, not as a temporal circumstance, but as what it essentially is, a transition between two states. Germanic, Slavic and Romance languages have different approaches to mapping real-world events onto verb forms. We are going to define the logic of each of these event paradigms. Such a rethink will show that verb forms across languages cannot be classified merely on the basis of contextual meaning. Rather, these forms are subject to language-specific models. In the second part, we plan to consider in detail the use of imperfective and perfective in Russian, with closer attention to particular verb affixes and specific subcategories, such as verbs of motion. Imagine an apple. How do you know that it is a separate object? What is its actual boundary? An object is limited by everything else around it. Individuality is in fact a duality. If there is an apple, there is a non-apple, or better say it's something that is not a specific apple. These words are words due to the gaps between them. A single word surrounded by everything else is a thing in itself, but in a flow of text, space-separate words are still only parts of an image corresponding to the whole sentence. If there are two apples, the non-apple space gets a new projection in a form of a gap between the apples, but the infinite darkness around still determines a single entity, which is now the group of apples. Now imagine there's only one apple, but you're sitting in a revolving chair, spinning at a high speed. You cannot tell if it is a single apple you are seeing or a number of them, as long as the unitary darkness is absent. The darkness is dissolved in the continuous process. If an apple appears again and again, after a little while that becomes a natural cause of things. It looks like a sequence of passages, but imagine that it is moving faster and faster. On the other hand, when you observe an emotionless object, you confirm its presence again and again. Perception is itself a process. A building that used to stand in some place has been repeatedly seen there. Conceptually, a process is as much homogeneous as a static state, because every fraction of it is denoted by the same verb and so has the same meaning. When knocking at the door, a backswing is also part of the action of knocking, and building a house has one and the same meaning regardless of the stage of construction. Both a static state and ongoing process appear as a kind of mass, quantified over time only. Let's just call it a state. For an English speaker, the difference between processes and static states may be notable, since it's reflected in the grammar. The progressive tense doesn't go well with the verb to know, so it looks like the internal dynamics really do matter. But a deeper aspect of this is that such a state cannot stop abruptly in real time. A personal knowledge doesn't end explicitly, you just realize at some point that you have forgotten what you knew. Also, a building that stands cannot stop standing and walk away. Stale forms like standing or lowing exist, and although one can stop knowing something, one can suddenly know something, so there's no strict boundary between dynamics and static states. A truly clear distinction is that between a single state and a succession of two states. To get an event, we need one state to end up in another state, and this new state is actually what makes the event feel like a temporal circumstance. In space, the known apple space extends outwards from the body of the apple up to infinity. In time, the known apple time follows the body of the event, becoming the present state of affairs. Once the image of an apple or a group of apples is followed by its absence, established as a continuing state, this absence gains focus in the same way as the apple's body does when it first appears on the scene. An event is basically a transition to a mutually exclusive state. This new state becomes the current one, which requires a certain meaning, since our mind cannot be focused on the vacuum, and a connection to the previous state is needed. If you say the apple is no longer here, it is a single state in a separate phrase. An event applies two states within the same phrase, mutually exclusive but both referring to something common that actually gets changed, the subject itself or an object or, as in our case, the subject position relative to the scene. So you could say the apple passed by or went away. One might say it has gone, but in such a case the present outcome appears disconnected from the initial process. To get an event as such, we need a succession of states. The light came on. This is a transition between two states, and it is the same when the light goes off. From the standpoint of this situation, the old state extends to infinity in the past, and the new state extends to the future as it continues with the march of time. We get a temporal apple with no need to walk around it. Time is linear and the previous state has no beginning in the context of the situation. 
There's nothing but a pair of states with open ends and mutually exclusive meanings, a pure polarity. If the light had changed gradually, we still couldn't say that the in-between period is the event itself. Taken alone, it is an infinite process of altering the intensity of the light, just as with the flight of apples, and so it tends to become the initial state itself, bringing us back to the primary duality. Suppose the light just blinks once, there are three parts to the action, dark, light and dark again, and hence two transitions, but as well you might want to say the light came on and then went off, and it would have to if the span were rather long. Even with a short period of light, we tend to stick to a single transition. Flashed is more associated with the light coming on, as it implies a more intense light, and therefore a high differential than that it blinked. If the light blinks twice or three times or blinks repeatedly as if sending a message by Morse code, the internal sequence is only a quality of the initial body of the event, just as color is the quality of an apple. The sequence becomes an event only with the absence of light clearly established, otherwise it's a continuous flickering. Right after something has happened, the reality is split into two parts, that where the statement is false and that where it is true. However, if we take the phrase happened every day, the value is true throughout the entire time frame of the situation. It is a self-identical continuity again, with the dark side getting no focus. In the same way as the continuous it was passing by stands for identical movements, the simple form in it passed by every day stands for identical passages. The activity took place in the past, but the phrase gives no idea of an explicit completion for the entire cycle. It is a stretch of an essentially infinite process that had only been observed for some time, but actually could still be running. It is a single state. However, the English simple tenses make no distinction between separate acts and cycles of acts. An apple passed by seems to be a single act, but if you add every day, it becomes a process. Apples passed by might also be both a process and a single passage of a group. The perfect tense leaves room for the same variance. Too late, this has already happened, or nothing special, this has already happened many times before. The reason is that the basic simple form stands for the body of the event only, and leaves the final state indefinite. On the language map of Europe, three models can be outlined that define how verbs reflect events, specifically events in the past. The approach used in Germanic languages, including English, proceeds from a general image of a temporal sequence associated with the verb stem, which is then combined with other words, arguments and verbals, and finally appears as either a process or a separate complete scenario or a cyclically repeated one, or a static state. At first sight this looks orderly, however the original lexical image may be associated with a single state like run and a change of states like cross, and yet these different notions are plugged into the syntax on equal terms and instantiated using the same forms. The question arises, what does the simple verb form itself stand for, then? The verb to run can also produce a resultant state, to run a mile, so it seems like to cross the road starts off with a second level of complexity. Still one might say, as he crossed the road he was hit, where the final state is not reached. This shows the simple verb form is in any case bound to the body of the event. The basic Germanic verb form in the past tense known as the preterit essentially denotes a stretching over time of the state associated with the verb stem. Any kind of stretch suggests something else that falls or precedes it, but within the simple form itself the additional state is indefinite, regardless of the lexical category of the verb. The focus is kept on the basic state. The final picture is a product of context. Without it, there's no way to tell a part of the process observed from its completion, although the lexical meaning can affect the choice of suitable collocations. A process can appear as both the initial and final state. Heron somewhere in 20 seconds could convey passing a certain distance and a delay before the process starts, in a way that reminds us of the variation between flashed and blinked. The verb remember it can mean storing something in memory, putting it to the memory, and retrieving it from there. The preterite utilizes a stretch of the basic state as a module of general purpose that can be used in a cycle like he crossed it every day, where completion of each pass is assumed contextually, and in a finite sequence he crossed it twice, which could be a unified complete scenario, depending again on the context. The same verb can stand for a static image, where the road cross the river. The perfect tense adds a sense of focus to the final state by breaking the timeline into two segments, but it utilizes the same simple form for the past action. This scenario has finally crossed it, provides a transition, but has crossed it many times, only asserts the truth of the subject past experience. The perfect is subject-oriented, as the common thing that connects the present with the past in this form is not the flow of the action, but only the subject itself. 
Equally subject-oriented is the progressive form, that represents a fraction of the process as a quality of the subject. An apple can be red or big or moving. In contrast, the concept of aspect used in Slavic languages is action-oriented, as it reflects the direct perception, we either see the same state of affairs holding, or witness a change that can take the form of an end or beginning of a process, or a single complete act or scenario. The former continuity corresponds to the imperfective aspect. He was crossing the road, as he crossed it, crossed it every morning, where the road crossed the river. It combines processes, repeated actions and static states merely because of the absence of a resultant state. On the contrary, a particular case of getting to the other side is perfective. He crossed the road and headed to the park, or he has finally crossed it, but with the perfective verb form used, the action appears accomplished right after the verb has been uttered. The hero's mind processing the verb itself performs the relevant transition to the resultant state and perceives it as actual, unlike in English, where you need the context for that. There are some language-specific variations when it comes to an iterated final state, like whenever he crossed it. The Slovak and Czech languages allow the perfective in such cases. Bulgarian also does, but in a special form, we will touch on this later. Here and after we will stick to the East Slavic group, along with Polish, where aspects are used in the most apparent way. In Russian, the final state of the perfective stays in effect in the context. The perfective for to cross generally means to get to the other side and stay there, in the sense of not crossing it again, or else that will be a process. As a result, the event appears as individual scenario. The very fact that the final state is continuous makes the temporal apple singular. Adverbals of periodicity like often or sometimes are limited to imperfective verbs in Russian. However, a finite number of repetitions may be perfective in the case of a connected succession with a single outcome, like that where someone has run the doorbell a few times, or crossed the road a number of times in a row, in both directions or maybe wandering in circles. This works as long as the outcome of one act doesn't prevent another act from happening. In the phrase, he crossed to the other side of the river twice, the other side is a definite error, and once you have got there, you are supposed to stay there in the context of the phrase. As well, he broke his leg twice can be perfective, unless he intentionally did it twice in a row. One day he broke his leg is perfective, as the leg stays broken in the described period. On the contrary, he broke his leg only once in his life is an imperfective phrase that clarifies the number of occasions of this specific experience for the related period, which is now the entire life of the subject. There is no perfect tense in Russian, and it can be translated with either aspect or form, depending on the definite result present. In the question, who has opened the window, the verb is perfective if the window is still open at the moment of speech. If it is closed, it's something that makes the speaker believe that it had been opened or closed again before that. No matter whether it happened once or a number of times, the situation requires the imperfective, because the relevant final state is not set. The question, have you eaten already, is imperfective when it's a concern about them having had any food since this morning. It is a more familiar version of, are you hungry? The perfective version would imply a certain single meal the person questioned was expected to have by that time. The aspect applies not only to the past tense. Each Slavic verb or participle is of a particular aspect. Typically, there is a basic imperfective verb that stands for some principal process or state. Different prefixes attached to it produce a number of individual perfective verbs. The imperfective pisat means to be written or write repeatedly. The perfective na pisat, which reads like on to write, means a single finished act in which something is written. Another perfective peri pisat means to rewrite also a finished act. We pisat means to copy out once, and so on. This resembles English phrasal verbs, and for many prefixes there are identical prepositions, but a perfective form denotes a single scenario only. To further represent the altered action as ongoing or repeated, from many perfectives, secondary imperfective forms are derived, most commonly through a suffix peri pisavet, vi pisavet. Slavic verb aspects are a core grammatical function, but the perfective logic itself requires an additional lexical value. So the relationship between the primary process and derived perfectives is one to many, while the secondary imperfectives represent pure aspectual counterparts.
However, not beside, has no secondary form. As the most trivial case of completion, it is just paired with the primary form. Besides, still this prefix is not the default one. For the process of reading, читать, to read something completely is прочитать, through read. And this perfective has its secondary and perfective form that might be used to convey a cover-to-cover -cover habitual reading. For eating, есть, there is a transitive perfective съесть, where the specified object gets eaten completely, and intransitive поесть, to have some kind of meal. Remember the verb remember. The basic imperfective is помнить, to remember, to keep in mind. The perfective запомнить means to memorize once, and вспомнить to recall once. And speaking of a process of directed motion, like walking, there are many options of equal rank. One can arrive or depart on foot, or among other things, one can cross some area by walking. In the case of crossing the road, the basic Russian imperfective denotes the process of walking, and the prefix means over or across. The combination produces a complete act where you cross something on foot. A real crossing involves two transitions, since the object has two edges. Still, for a randomly moving particle that accidentally crosses a line, it is a pure polarity. Besides, the specific pattern of crossing is only a product of the prefix, and not the aspect itself. If we replace the prefix with another one, pre, which conveys the sense of attaching to something, we get the meaning arrived on foot, or simply came. In this case, we have no idea about the beginning of the initial walking. For both arrival and crossing, achieving the final state is the main transition. A negated perfective arrival negates the achieved state, and so refers to a specific awaited visit, while imperfective just means that they have not appeared yet. A negated perfective crossing means that the subject has failed to reach the other side, while the imperfective tells that no crossing has been performed at all. There are perfective forms where the prefix conveys the beginning of process. So, пошел does this for directed walking and means simply went in a specific direction that is usually supplied. The main process appears as the final state here, but the paradox is that the beginning of a process equally means completion of some small initial portion of that process. Otherwise, we simply wouldn't be able to conclude that the process had begun. This is actually a version of the Zeno paradox. If a point moves away from a line, the distance increases to infinity. If it approaches a line, the gap decreases also infinitely. It seems that the point will never cross the line, but somehow it finally crosses it. There is no point in thinking of lines, because it's only polarity that really matters. Aspects are used with a future tense, but present activity is naturally imperfective only. Even an infinitesimal piece of the final state makes the event complete. Think of the paradoxical meaning of here and away just now. The actual now moment always precedes our thinking about it. Once we are facing that man's absence, the transition is already over and the event is in the past. A small set of perfective verbs are used to denote short actions, such as a single knock, sneeze, wink or blink. These so-called punctive verbs are marked not by a prefix, but by a suffix of no. For instance, the primary imperfective стучать refers to the process of knocking. The prefix perfective постучать is about complete sequence of knocking, and the punctive perfective стукнуть denotes a single knock. Note that the specific pun also has its own marker. The idea of something point-like is not the basis of the perfective aspect, but only its special case. The elementary basis is a change in state, and the resultant state is the ultimate meaning of the Slavic perfective. The Russian equivalent of when, when applied to a perfective verb, points exclusively at the period of time that directly follows the transition. The term for aspect in many Slavic languages is vid, which means view, and the names of the two aspectual forms are non-completed and completed. A common explanation given by native speakers is that imperfective is about a process, and perfective is about a result, and it's always a good idea to take what native speakers say literally. Some linguists couldn't grasp that, and have used definitions like a single unanalyzable whole, which reflects a purely English view on events as external circumstances. Another word that can be found is unbound for the imperfective versus bound for the perfective, which still proceeds from the body of the event. The question is bound by what? The perfective doesn't denote the body of the action bound on the right side of the timeline. It denotes the resultant state bound by the action on the left side. And here we come to one more event paradigm that is constantly confused with Slavic aspects. 
In Greek and in the Romance languages, there is an event dichotomy of imperfect and aorist. The language-specific forms go by different names, but still conform to the same concept. The main criterion in it is not a resultant state, as in the Slavic aspect, but the viewpoint position, that is, how far the action is from the virtual observer within the time frame of the context. When the observer's attention gets focused on the flow of eventuality, it is imperfect, and when the action is viewed from the perspective of the following period of time, it is errorist. To see how it differs from the Slavic model, let's consider an action that is not resultative, but rather processual, such as dancing. The imperfect, like the imperfective, can denote both a progression and a repeated cycle, but only that which is observed from within. Whether he was dancing when they came, or he used to dance back then, there is some immersion into the image or process. On the contrary, the aorist refers to a separate fact that has taken place. It may be an explicitly accomplished single action, like having one dance with a certain girl, which complies with the perfective, but also it may be a general fact of activity having taken place, such as a claim that he really did dance in our club on Friday, which is imperfective in Russian, because the object of the statement is the process as such, and not its completion. In the aorist, finalization still depends on the verb stem and the context. The Greek romance model functions as a kind of zoom lens, focusing on the action flow is imperfect, whereas viewing it from distance is aorist. Furthermore, at a shorter distance, aorist captures a single action, and on a larger scale, it can integrate a general experience. That's why in the romance family, the perfect tends to be replaced by the aorist, and the distinction is drawn instead between the near and the remote past, within a norm-breaking segment. We won't delve into the romance paradigm, as our goal here was only to point out that its concept is different from that of the contrast between perfective and perfective aspects. In the Bulgarian verb system, and to a degree in the languages of the Balkans, both Slavic and Greek dichotomy coexist in combinations as the imperfective aorist, which expresses a particular fact relating to the absorbed initial state, the perfective aorist used for a single accomplished action, the imperfective imperfect, which conveys the continuity of the initial state as ongoing or recurring, and the perfective imperfect, which does the same for the final state, in phrases like whenever he crossed, with focus on the sense of having crossed as a background state. This is mostly used in dependent clause. In the Slavic verb aspects, a continuous process is opposed to a continuous result. This approach concerns solely how the eventuality itself is structured in the related time frame. In the Greek Romance model, the key is the viewpoint position in respect to the eventuality, but in any case within the same contextual frame. Finally, in the Germanic paradigm, the basic verb form is rather a module in a context that sets the scale and ordering of the eventuality with the help of adverbals and periphrastic forms, so no wonder that the English verb system is commonly illustrated by plotting a time layout. The term aspect was used initially for the Slavic verb forms, but Western philosophy introduced the concept of lexical aspect, where individual verbs are classified as activities, such as running, accomplishment like crossing, states like knowing, and other categories that vary among different authors. The distinction is generally about how verbs behave in the context, so it is biased towards the Germanic paradigm, even though the lexical meaning has some effects in any language. To avoid confusion, the Slavic aspect is sometimes referred to as grammatical. And lately, the term aspect has been used to generalize verb forms and functions across languages by using terms like progressive, habitual, or iterative. Unfortunately, the terms imperfective and perfective are loosely used for verb forms that conform to the concept of the imperfect and aorist contrast, despite the fact that, in translation, the Slavic perfective appears as rather a subset of the aorist. Without a complete understanding of event paradigms, any aspectual classification is superficial. The English progressive is generally translated into Russian with an imperfective verb, so we might say that it falls into the scope of imperfective, but nonetheless it belongs to a different model. And the very reason why there is no progressive form in the Slavic verb system is that its temporal logic proceeds from the change of states and not the scale of the action. There is no point wondering whether the simple form in English is perfective or imperfective. It is neither as functionally incomplete, being just a sort of temporal macro object. It would be legitimate to classify the English simple, progressive and perfect as grammatical aspects of a specific event model. Thus we have three different notions labeled as aspect. Grammatical, lexical and what could be called pragmatic. 
What can be said about the general notion of aspect? Is there a difference from tense in that tenses are about positions on the timeline, while aspect concerns the temporal structure of a particular action or state within the time frame of the verb phrase? However, these functions work in combination, because the temporal sequence denoted by a verb, which we call eventuality, has not only an internal pattern, but also an end. Both an event and a process are subject to temporal duality, because the idea of continuous process also implies two successive fractions to be compared and recognized as identical, after which we assume that the next fraction will be the same, due to inertia. The statement, he writes books, is true even if the writer is sleeping at the moment of speech, but imagine he got hit by a car and the doctor says he has no chance. It now seems inappropriate to say, he writes books. Everything is opposed to something else. There is no word without an empty space and no absolute without a non-absolute. The very notion of a separate entity implies ineffable mysterious darkness all around that delineates everything and in doing so both creates things and destroys them. But as you try and think about this silent delimiter, it itself pretends to be an entity. Any dichotomy is only a projection of the primary polarity. Everything is dual. Individuality is only a temporary phantom.